uh, we'll start this uh, new session on, on Europe. Well, my name is Jean-Marc Quickly. I'm a head of global risk and resilience at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. I'd like to, to thank the EPC for uh, this opportunity to, to talk about uh, this very important concept of international relations power and to look at power uh, across uh, different uh, regions as well as the way it has been uh, exerting and it will be in the future. So the previous panel uh, talked about power as a given. So we're talking about limitation, temptation and ambition. This panel is rather about something that should materialize um, and uh, probably it has to do with the fact that we're talking about European power and if we talk about the EU, we are talking about a polity which is considerably different from a previous panel because we're not talking about the nation states, but an aggregate uh, of uh, different uh, states. So to, to talk about taking stocks about uh, where are Europeans uh, going and um, what they are doing, we have a really distinguished uh, panel um, with first uh, Sir Michael Lee, a senior fellow of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, uh, former ambassador Ratislav Kasher, uh, former ambassador of Slovakia to Hungary and honorary chairman at Glapsek in Bratislava, and Mr. Franco Bruni, uh, vice president and co-head Europe and Global Governance, Italian Institute for International Political Study, ISPE, and finally, Mr. Guillaume Clusa, Closa, sorry, special advisor to the Vice President of the EU as well as Emerit Emeritus President of uh, European NELVA, a think tank. Right, Let, let's start, we'll have two parts in our discussion. First, uh, looking at where we are now and what are the current challenges that uh, face Europe in terms of exerting power. If we look at the European project starting in the 90s, there were lots of optimism in terms of building a new governance structure that would integrate Eastern and Western European countries. And this optimism looks like that peaked in 2004 with the big enlargement of uh, the EU since, uh, to, uh, sin seems to have uh, declined since then because of the financial crisis, because of uh, international relations where Europe has not been a very strong actor. So let's first look at uh, f um, economics and, uh, and, uh, and finance. And um, I'd like to, to ask first uh, Mr. Bruni, but where are we now in terms of Europe ha having recovered from the financial crisis? Well, um, Europe, uh, thank you very much for having me here first. and. Uh, it's my first time at this dialogue and hope it's not the last one. Um, well, uh, we had our, mm, we, we, we have imported the US crisis in 2008 and then we were able to build our own crisis in 2010, 11, 12. Uh, now we have been recovering uh, with a series of measures and our Union is now more robust uh, also from a financial point of view. Uh, the growth rate is still uh, inadequate, uh, if you want, but uh, and, and less than potential, uh, lower than potential. It's not, uh, uh, the convergence of European economies is uh, still insufficient. Uh, there are uh, important differences between uh, our countries, structural differences. And there's no incentive to uh, accelerate structural reforms that would uh, increase convergence and make Europe more uh, uniform and, and robust. So this is the uh, this is the bad uh, the bad side of the coin. And um, we can say that uh, the European single market is still there. is is, a, is the largest market in the world. And uh, the potential of Europe is still uh, very, very high. And on average, uh, we have been able also to help each other. I mean, we have, uh, we have pooled resources uh, and we have been able to recover, to help uh, at least five countries in Europe, uh, Ireland, uh, Portugal, Spain, uh, Greece, and Cyprus. 
in some cases, the interventions were sizable, uh, important, and uh, successful. Um, we have a lot of plans for the future. Uh, I'm afraid uh, there are plans, and I'm not sure that these portfolios that the Commission is so good in preparing and detailing, uh, I'm afraid that they might not be successful when the political decision will come, uh, not completely successful at least, but the plans are there. And let me just point at two of them because they have also a, 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 a very special uh, meaning. One is the more political one, a more wide one, and the other one is a more economic and technical one. The uh, first portfolio, and, and these are two among, uh, say, tens of, of, of portfolios that are under discussion for the next steps to deepen uh, Europe. The first, the first uh, portfolio I want to, to, to mention is the, uh, is the new uh, multi-annual budget of the European, uh, of the European Union. In, in Europe, we have a, a seven-year period of, of, of budgeting. The, 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 the budget of the Union is very small, it's less than 1% of GDP, uh, and the idea is not to increase it uh, very much, I mean, because politically this seems unfeasible for the moment. But there are very interesting uh, plans for improving the, its quality. And in particular, we would like to produce more European public goods with this budget, because up to now, the budget of the European Union has been devoted especially to transfers of money, say to agriculture, to, low, to, to less uh, rich region, regions, etc. And this has given the impression that what we are doing, we are really transferring money from one country to the other. Now we would like to really pool resources and produce uh, goods that are and services that are common goods, uh, like defense, uh, assistance to migration, uh, security, um, uh, you know, uh, and many, many other, and, uh, even insurance against unemployment, and so on and so forth. Uh, and this will probably, hopefully, uh, convince the, uh, the Europeans that it's, there's no point in calculating the Dood des with the Union, like uh, the British, for instance, have been doing for a lot of time. We give to the Union a certain amount of money. What, how much do we receive? Are we balancing this? Well, this is uh, uh, meaningless in a Union, really. We want to give money in order to produce common goods so that this calculation is no longer uh, uh, meaningful. Uh, the second portfolio I just want to mention, because this is highly technical, but I just want to stress its importance in spite of the fact that it, we can never really talk about this because it's very unpopular, especially in Europe. It's monetary, uh, it's banking and capital markets union. This is the first priority in the Commission's idea up to now, uh, to really integrate the banking system and the capital markets. First priority, I'm not sure that this will really be successful, but it's extremely important also from a political point of view. It's a very, to have a common and integrated capital markets, it's, it's, it's a, the way to share the risks, uh, even if we don't have a risk sharing through public finance. This is what we call private risk sharing. It's what really helps the United States to stay together, uh, even if the, trans the fiscal transfers inside the United States are not that large. The, we calculate uh, that uh, nearly 40% of the uh, uh, specific shocks that hit uh, parts of the United States are really uh, absorbed by the uni unified capital markets in, in the States, and we would like to have something similar. Right, thank you very much. Um, so moving now from uh, the economics to defense, uh, Mr. Closer, could you just highlight uh, where we are now in terms of European defense. Uh, this, uh, this week, President Macron uh, highlighted his idea of creating a European army. This is not a new concept, but uh, could you just develop a bit more about uh, Europe's willingness to project power? Yes, but let me just complement what you have said because we can see uh, the glass full empty or, uh, or full full. And for me, if we look at the European economy, uh, and we benchmark with the US economy for last year, for example, 
the growth of the EU was superior to the one of the US. We got our highest level of employment for the last two decades. Uh, we have created 15 uh, uh, million uh, jobs and uh, many much, much more qualified jobs. Uh, we have a banking union which is not completely uh, sa satisfactory, but it's working. So there are many positive steps. And uh, these different steps uh, were very difficult or would have been very difficult to to obtain before the crisis. And we, we may say that we, we have went ahead with regard to the European construction. And second, but it's a very important remark. If we look at uh, European barometers, uh, Euro bar barometers, which are in fact survey on what the European citizen think with regard to the EU, we have the highest level with regard to the last 20 years. And we see that with regard to uh, defense, banking union, security, uh, sustainable development, European citizens want to go ahead. The difficulty we have is there is a, an increasing uh, part of the population uh, which is uh, uh, voting for po populist party, but at the same time, since the British referendum, nobody wants to go out of the EU. So I would say something has changed in positive paradoxically. Now, when we speak about the European defense, uh, what you, we have to understand is uh, the game has changed, and we have spoken about this uh, game uh, changing uh, period. Uh, now, everybody in Europe is aware that the alliance with the US is not exactly the one it was before. Now, everybody in the EU is aware that there is a risk with Russia. Now, everybody in Europe is aware that we, we need to organize ourselves for our future. And this is something relatively uh, new. Uh, defense and security is not something new in Europe. We had 50 years or 60 years ago a debate in order to organize our security. We made the choice of NATO. And NATO somehow was to delegate our security to the US. Um, but 20 years ago, we, we started a security and defense process with the Berlin Plus Agreement, which was to start uh, developing uh, autonomous defense capacity. And step by step, we have organized a European security and defense uh, doctrine. We have developed a European Institute for, European Af for in um, International Affairs. Uh, which develop a, a common understanding of, of, of the challenges we have ahead. Uh, last year, we launched uh, uh, in Brussels uh, a common center. Uh, we launched a European uh, Research and Development Fund for Defense. And last week, we, we spoke again on the possibility of a European army. So we are in a period where, which was a taboo debate for decades, become a possibility. Become a possibility. Uh, let's speak frankly. If we have a European army, it does not mean that uh, NATO disappears. Not at all. It just means, because of course, also because the US asks us, there is a new balance, or there will be a new balance in NATO, because European nation states are uh, financing much more and, and are going to, 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 to finance their security much more at the request of President Trump, let's be clear. But once you give more money for your security, you want to have the control of your security. And of course, it changes the, the, the game. So somehow it means that step by step, but surely we are going toward a, a more autonomous European defense, and I think Within NATO, there will be two pillars, a North American one and an EU one, an additional member of, uh, of the, NATO, uh, the NATO family. And we are going toward this, uh, this, uh, this, this path, maybe more quickly than what we could have thought two or three years uh, ago. This is a good thing. Right. Thank you very much. So 
we looked at the economics and finance, defense, and um, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Kluza, uh, the rise of populism in Europe. So my next question is for uh, Ambassador Kasser. In your uh, previous or last appointment, as we discussed last night, you were in Hungary, and uh, we were saying that you witnessed the rise of populism, and I would like you to develop a bit more about your experience and what do you see, how, uh, what kind of danger does this movement represent to uh, European integration? Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. It's uh, hard to entertain people after the great lunch in such a spoiling environment. There's too many attractions for that, so it's hard to compete, but I'll try anyway. Before I come to this plague of populism and renewed uh, nationalism, let me touch a little bit the sense of power, what we talk about. Because when I got the invitation, I have to tell you, I was just intrigued to see the silver line going through about the notion of power. And uh, we often think of power as something, you know, where as, as, as the ability to, the classical definition probably would be the power is the ability to make people do things or prevent people doing things you don't want to. Uh, here um, is an excellent book, and uh, I think uh, for, the, for the session we heard uh, very good introductions by, uh, by, 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 <coughs> by Madam President, but also what I like was Minister uh, Gargash notion where he said, the changes uh, occurring in the world currently will have great implication for the region, and it's very hard to predict what are going to be those implications. Well, here I would recommend the reading. Let me give you a suggested reading for all of you. It's a book written in 2013, but it's still, it's still valid, uh, which is strange because oh, usually books written in these days by politologists uh, usually evaporate within one or two years. The book is by Moises Naim and, uh, and it's titled The End of Power. And he's writing there that the power is becoming much more uh, hard to retain, it's easier to get, it's easier to lose, it's more fragmented. Uh, smaller players might be surprised by the power, larger players uh, may get erosion of the power. Uh, and he explained why this is going on. And uh, I'll come, when I come to the end, you will see how it uh, uh, correlates uh, to the region, but not only to the region, but to the rise of populism and rise of extremism in the all liberal uh, Western world. But I want to stop with efficiency of power for Europe. Because in Europe, we usually tend to speak Europe as a soft power uh, king in the world. We were charming by our example, by cooperation, precisely as you, Mr. Chairman, said, it's a cluster, that's not a traditional nation state. Though here, my question would be, what is the traditional nation state? Is China a nation state? By Central European definition, it's not. It's just a cluster of rise nations with a hugely and very efficiently centralized uh, power being in the hands. Uh, so, you know, and there are other examples where we've got one nation scattered among many states and not centralized at all. So, you know, it's hard to say what is the nation state. Uh, Europe, for, for being a cluster of, uh, and let me use for, for for clarification, the example of, of a nation state as a cluster was extremely efficient in power, though being soft power, because we were making others do things, say, through our legislation. We are a half billion market, which is a share, you would say, what is the share of population? That share of a market is disproportionate. And if you want to get to the market, you need to accommodate to EU legislation. We saw it when we were applying for our membership. It took us a number of years to accommodate all of our legislation, to change everything. So EU was extremely powerful because they made us, or it made us, change course of our action and how things we do. It applies to all of those who are not EU. And I'm just uh, often smiling of all the campaign on Brexit saying, oh, now we're off and we don't have to accommodate. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you have to accommodate if you want to do the trade and if you want to be part of the single uh, market. That's what applies to Norway, that applies to uh, Switzerland, that applies to many other countries which are part of, of, uh, of European uh, single market, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So EU was efficient. Um, the world is changing, and I want to come uh, to what, how it's changing. 
world is changing in the way where the speed is a little bit too much. And we as a human species, we have certain capacity to absorb the change. And uh, if that change is faster than our capacity to absorb the change, we feel very uncomfortable. Uh, species don't like change. Species hate change. Species are afraid of change. And I think here we have <laughs> the, the speed of change in globalized world and the driver is globalization, which is a little bit frightening people in the Western liberal world. And that is creating uh, populism, that is creating uh, uh, renewed nationalism, because now you've got magicians of politics who come and say, okay, so the wheel is running too fast. I can slow it down for you, don't worry. I will return world to the place where it used to be, where you felt so comfortable, but I'm afraid this is impossible. This is absolutely impossible. So we see the rise, uh, Hungary is a classic example of uh, regrown nationalism, regrown nostalgia, it comes back to the revisionism. We see the same phenomena a little bit in Russia for different reasons, but uh, on the continent it's the same thing. But we see growth of populist parties all around. This is not nothing specific in, in Central Europe. What is for me very painful is that we see a new divide uh, uh, in Europe, like the old and the new. I want to stop here on the notion which Europe needs for the future on this new globalized world. Uh, what we need, it's not a populism and definitely not coming back to the narrow-minded uh, nation state uh, focus. Globalization brings challenges which are already beyond capacity of big nations and traditional big nation states. We need more integration, but we should stop talking about more Europe or less Europe. We need to focus very specifically in which areas we need more cooperation, more integration, and in which areas we need to make Europe more flexible because as a large uh, entities, you need the principle of subsidiarity. What can be done at the lowest level should be done at the lowest level, and you have to focus uh, on the efficiency of, of, of centralized power. Last comment on the European army. We should stop talking, we should stop using this language because it's harmful. Uh, common army, that is something which is used by centralized entity, by nation state. What we need, it's more of a common defense capacities, capabilities, more defense planning, because common army, that's a long, long way to go. When we speak of common army, then we just delude, we take attention uh, of something where we are not and we are not going to come. It's a shame that we have a very little standardization. Even if we use similar caliber, even the same caliber, you may have a French and German using the same caliber, but you, you wouldn't have the, uh, used the ammunition uh, from uh, one army to another, because despite having the same caliber, usually or rarely uh, you can, on the sophisticated, uh, uh, on sophisticated technology, you, you, you cannot use it, you know. So uh, we should be proper in our language and proper in our ambitions. We need more Europe, we need more Europe in the areas where it's needed, and we need less bureaucracy in the areas where it's not needed. Right, thank you uh, for this. Um, Sir Lee, um, let's talk a bit about Brexit and try to expand about what Brexit is a, uh, an example of in terms of the dynamics that we see uh, in Europe and uh, um, the economic problem also that uh, Brexit will represent uh, for, for the UK. Would you like to expand on that? If they like, I would prefer not to have right. to expand <laughs> on it, but as it's on the table, yes indeed. But first of all, I'd like to thank Ed Sissem very much indeed for this invitation and to congratulate you and the EPC for this uh, wonderful meeting. Um, I know what it is to organize a meeting like this, and when everything goes smoothly, nobody notices, um, but I, it, it's really very well done indeed. Congratulations. Um, Brexit is uh, one of the challenges that the EU is facing at the moment, and Brexit will have the most serious consequences, no doubt, for the UK, but it has very serious consequences for the EU as well. And I don't think we should underestimate the impact of this challenge or of the other major challenges that the EU is facing. Um, in Brussels, sometimes one is rather tempted, and I've been in that place myself as well, to develop a presentation of proposals and so on, as if they were realities. But in fact, the main reality now is that the EU 
is facing many internal challenges, including Brexit, and it must come to terms with these if it wishes to exercise a role in the world, and especially if it wishes to resume its claim to be a normative power whose values, whose internal values, uh, can influence others. Uh, the loss of the United Kingdom to the EU, I think, should not be underestimated. Uh, contrary to many views, I think the UK has actually contributed a great deal to the EU over the years, and the idea that with the UK out, it will then be much easier to pursue reforms in, in security and defense or other areas, I take with uh, a pinch of salt. I mean, the UK, the second largest economy in the EU, one of only two member states with the capacity to project power beyond the EU's immediate neighborhood, um, one of two member states, permanent members of the UN Security Council, I think there will be a significant impact uh, on, on both sides. But you asked about what this signifies, and I think Brexit is the local British manifestation of this phenomenon that is very often described wrongly, I think, as populism. It comes in many different varieties, the left wing, right wing, nationalist, Eurosceptical, um, extremist, anti-system, you name it. But this is the local manifestation of this phenomenon. And as elsewhere, it springs from two main sources. One source is essentially economic, and the notion of voters stirred up by political leaders that they are victims of globalization, uh, victims of automation, and that they have been left by the wayside and that they have been uh, forgotten. And I think this contributes quite a lot to the uh, sentiment in favor of Brexit in the UK, and it's contributing also to the so-called populist movements in other member states. I must say it's not only the extremist parties that are responsible for whipping up this sentiment, it's also to a considerable degree the, the failure of centre-left and centre-right parties to respond adequately to the concerns on the part of voters. By the way, I think that same phenomenon exists on the other side of the Atlantic as well as uh, in different parts of the world. So Brexit, I think, is part of that phenomenon. But um, one shouldn't underestimate how far it goes. I'm living in Italy at the moment, and uh, the, the, the government in Italy is uh, composed of uh, two uh, populist movements, if you will. Um, there are many of uh, journalists, writers, academics in Italy who are convinced that uh, the leader of uh, one of the main elements in the Italian government has as, as his goal to uh, take Italy out of the Euro, if not to destroy the Euro system. Others would challenge that. They would say, no, 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 this is just rhetoric, and so on. In the end, the constraints will kick in. But the thought that not only in Central and Eastern Europe, where to some extent it was always going to take time, I think, for countries to uh, become mature liberal democracies, but actually in at least two, if not three, of the original founding member states of the European Union, Italy and France, it could well be that Eurosceptic parties will come top of the poll in next May's European Parliament elections, and I think we need to take stock of that and consider what the implications of that are. And in other member states where this hasn't quite come about, as in the Netherlands, a mainstream party has only been able really to hold on to power by absorbing many of the Eurosceptic and anti-migration policies of the more extremist parties. So this situation should give us grounds for concern. And when, for example, we turn to the question of Eurozone reform, if we look at the position of the Dutch government, strongly in favor of the European Union traditionally, um, the, the Dutch Prime Minister has tried to launch a, a group of northern European states known loosely as the Hanseatic League II. And their position very clearly is to oppose President Macron's um, proposals for Eurozone reform. Uh, they're willing to see the European stability mechanism take on a role of vetting member state budgets, but they say very clearly no finance minister, no Eurozone budget, and no fundamental reform of the Eurozone. 
And we're not talking here about marginal Central European countries. So I think the picture of the EU today is an organization whose central achievements remain, but it's in a period of remission between major crises, crises within the Eurozone, but also, of course, in the EU's other signature achievement, the Schengen uh, border free system within the EU, uh, which is still very much under pressure uh, from the 2015 migration crisis and its consequences. So I think we see an EU today full of ambition. We see figures such as President Macron and the outgoing Commission President uh, Juncker, extremely ambitious as far as, as far as reforms are concerned, but we also see very serious breaks on this reform process, and it could well be that the elections to the European Parliament next May might turn out to be a tipping point in this process. Thank you. Um, we've been talking so far about uh, the need for more integration, more cooperation. You were talking about normative power. The question that we can ask is, it looks like Europe has difficulties in speaking from one voice. Uh, is divided internally, and something which is new, uh, this is a state of transatlantic relation which has been a bedrock of uh, Western influence since uh, the Second World War. Uh, just, I mean, we've been quoting President Trump quite a lot uh, until now, but uh, in response to uh, President Macron's initiative to beef up a European army, when he was on his way to Paris, he tweeted uh, this tweet. Uh, very insulting, uh, talking about um, this, this idea, but perhaps Europe should first pay its fair share of NATO, which the U.S. subsidizes greatly. So I think that over the last 70 years, we've never seen such a low in terms of transatlantic uh, relations. So if Europe has to enter or re-enter the, the power game, and this is an open question for uh, the forwards. What, would, what are the recipe and also uh, the ability of Europe to expand its possible alliances, not just with uh, the United States, but Asia and the Middle East? Who wants to take the first question, Mr. Bruni? Well, you know, the power struggle is not really the preferred game of Europe. Uh, we, we are strongly multilateralist. We are uh, we tend to, to, to see the world in a way which is incompatible with this new idea of zero-sum games where the bigger and the stronger wins. So uh, Europe will be able to uh, grow only in a world which, uh, uh, where, where, where Europe can go back and be the laboratory of, of global multilateralism, as we have been in a way, together with the states, uh, after the Second World War. Uh, let me just uh, cite uh, a very uh, fantastic European uh, person, Stephen, Stephen Zweig. He was an a Austrian intellectual that uh, during the 30s had to fly to the South, South America where he committed suicide after, uh, in, in, I think, I think 1943. 43. Um, with his wife. Yeah, with his wife, together. It was sort of a very romantic suicide, in a way. Um, uh, and uh, and he, he wrote, in, 19, uh, in 1934, in 1934, he, he wrote, Europe has to become a United State. And for this idea to have real effects, we have to push it outside the exoteric sphere of intellectuals, using all the modern means and techniques of communication to reach the masses and talk to their hearts. Mm. I mean, I think this is impressive. I mean, it's 1934, and it's hitting the two main mm, points of the current problem. That is, first, uh, you have to, um, to talk to the hearts and not only to the minds, because in terms of minds, 
Europe has already been made in a way. We have all the, the, the recipes, we have all the theory, we have all the intention, we have, we have, uh, it's, and it's a model for the world in a, in a way. Uh, uh, but, but in terms of hearts, we still have to reach the majority of our populations, especially in a, in a, in a world uh, that as has been observed before, uh, it's changing continuously and it's putting a lot of stress to people in order to keep changing with the world. So we have to really talk to the hearts in, in, in a, in, 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 with, with the following message. If you want to be helped in changing in a productive way, you have to look at the <coughs> at the European uh, uh, arena as a, as a common, as a common, uh, as a common effort. And second, mm -hmm. using all the means of communication. This is something that we still have to learn how to do in Europe because we still, uh, the, the discussion on, uh, on Europe is still uh, very, very immature and, and uh, uh, much less mature than Europe itself uh, is. So. Uh, and I think there's no, no alternative to that. We can have a common defense capability. I think this is the right if word, no common hurt, defense capability, and we are, we are working on it. I mean, recently with the, uh, the last commission and the uh, vice president Mogherini, there have been very important steps done in this direction. I think with the benefits also, a little bit the benefit also of the, of the, of the Middle East because there's, there's been some substantial work done by, by the Europeans around here uh, for some. Um, so we, we, we can have a common defense capability but we cannot look at ourselves as a sort of a, a, a game, a, a power a, a protagonist in the, the power game in the world. I mean we need, our power game in the, in the world is to convince the Americans first which are the the, the most uh, e e traditional allies of Europe uh, to go back to uh, a, a vision of the world where it's not uh, the strongest guy who wins, but it's humanity in itself that it's able to organize itself in a, a, in a civilized and co cooperative way. Uh, and there's no, there's no real winner if there are losers around. Yeah, just picking up on the use of technology, I think, uh, Mr. Closa, you're uh, strongly working on, on this issue at, uh, at the EU level when it comes to, to AI. So would you like to, to, to say more about how uh, the EU can project its power in uh, the technological field and in innovation? Yeah, yeah, just I wanted to, to complement one thing. When uh, Macron spoke about the European army, in fact, he, he spoke about the, the capacity to coordinate our army, so it's capacity building, and let's be very clear. But the debate is open, and it's a good thing. Uh, second, speaking about Stefan Zweig, uh, I think the real issue for Europe is indeed to create a, a kind of democratic dynamic, because European citizens want to be active and to have their say. They want to control their, their, their collective future, and we see that in all opinion survey in Europe, they want to be actors of their future. Could, uh, I, could I just ask, I mean, you know, we're, we're, it's good to provoke a bit of discussion, yes, I think. Yeah, you can. I mean, fine for opinion polls, but then why are they increasing numbers voting for political parties that are openly Eurosceptic and, and anti-Europe? Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yes, but I fully agree with what you said. We are in a period of big shift, and when you are in a period of big shift, and if I would have to compare, we were exactly in the same period at the end of Middle Age and Renaissance. All the uh, national, all the traditional reference have disappeared in the world. You see that in Brazil, in Argentina, in the US, uh, in some African country, uh, in Europe, of course. And this is a fundamental movement of the period because everything is changing. We have several industrial revolutions. There is a question of, of the place of the human being in the world. And intellig uh, artificial intelligence uh, poses a lot of, uh, of issues. You have a rebalance of power, which was expected, but which is very quick. And all that, of course, changes uh, the, the fundamental of society in the world. It's not a European topic. And all democracy also, have the same issues, which is how to, 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 to uh, rethink oneself in a period of big transformation. Once, 
uh, once we say, we say that, we need to go ahead. Regarding power, I think there is an agreement in Europe that uh, we want to be a transformative multilateral power. We, we believe in multilateralism and we believe in a cooperative balance world. And we try to use our capacity in terms of uh, soft power and, and the little hard power we may have in order to contribute, to be contributor to uh, a better world. So uh, in the Middle East or in Africa, in Somalia, in Syria, we try to contribute to nation state building or, 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 or rebuilding. We are asked everywhere in the world, and you know that also, to, to, to contribute, and we have some skills for that. We have no very strong art skills, but we have the skills to uh, contribute to, 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 uh, to peace building, to conflict prevention, and we try to use them. We can use them much better, but I think since we have this uh, uh, foreign service, which is a European external action service, we, we try also to coordinate and, to, uh, and to, to lead. Now for me the topic is, because we speak about the future of multi multilateralism, how we see this future. And, and for me, we have big challenges with artificial intelligence, with sustainable de de um, development and uh, uh, climate warming, etc. And, and we, we need to see globally how we can rethink the world. You know that today in Paris, there is a uh, an appeal uh, for the future of the cyber uh, environment. Uh, against cyber war. Uh, we are in a new reality and we, we need to adapt our tools to this new uh, reality. And last point, regarding the EU, I think there is an understanding, and this was in the budget, that we have societal challenges. Migration, climate change, um, artificial intelligence, etc. And, and the topic for us is to see how together we can develop answers to these challenges, which are local, European, and global, and to articulate the different, uh, the different level. And in Europe, there is a willingness to be a leader in this new, in this new period, at least for these topics. If I, if I may, vis-a-vis sure. -vis populism, and I, it's a question also for the others, is it true to, I mean, my impression is that after all, Europe is in better shape than the United States. I mean, the fact, the fact that, uh, you know, there's these uh, votes uh, against Europe, it's just because the enemy, if the enemy is the foreigner, in, in, in Europe it's easier to find the foreigner because it's just uh, very near able. to you. Uh, but, and, and moreover, both America and Russia are working hard to, this, to, to weaken Europe yes, uh, solidarity, and they're working in a very material sense. I mean, there, there's a lot of money from Russia yes. to uh, finance uh, anti-European yes. movements, and uh, in, in terms of Americans, it's is, is more difficult to say. There is Steve Bannon say, uh, from the American side, uh, which is developing a foundation in order yeah, to undermine yeah, Europe. Yeah, so we are attacked in a very hard way, and we resist. After all, uh, it's not a, it's just an issue of polls. If you look at the serious uh, forecast for the future European Parliament, the composition is going to be extremely solid, even if there is it's going to be a substantial number of populists represented there. So uh, I, would, uh, I would not be so pessimist on, on the populistic uh, future of, of Europe. I mean, but maybe I will be pessimistic on the future of the UK. <laughs> yeah. So Katja, you wanted to, to follow up on that? I saw that you were, you were smiling at uh, what Mr. Bruni said. Um, you know, I'm laughing because I was Slovak ambassador in the United States for five years, since 2003 to 2008. And uh, you're absolutely right. But I'm just laughing how, how well we are because uh, Trump managed to set the bar so low that if we get accommodated by this bar matching, then we are all doomed, you know? If you ask me in 2003 when I was coming to the United States, and I worked with Americans a lot on, on NATO agenda for almost 30 years now, if you would have asked me, uh, could anybody like Mr. Trump win uh, the US elections, I would say you would have to be lunatic. <laughs> but about one month before the election, I said, Jesus Christ, this may happen, you know? And, uh, and what we will do? 
And what we will do, this is maybe a good Kickstarter for Europe because we are always hand in hand with Americans. Uh, and uh, we always said how, how we are close on values and democracies do not fight and cooperation is more efficient in all the stuff, uh, which is even proven on the facts so that that's a reality. But we, we shift it and maybe this uh, confrontation, because we are expect confrontation by Russia, we expect. Yes, uh, Russia is a non competitive country with a lot of resources wasted. And since they cannot compete, they try to pull us down. And with new technologies, you can be extremely efficient on Infowar. So you got a cheap date, you know. So for little money, you got Big Bang. And you see us fighting uh, uh, among ourselves. And you see the efficiency. Um, and let me use it. I, I completely, Sir Michael, I completely agree on the, on the notion of populism. I use it only as a, because I cannot find any single one uh, quick label for that. And now, now we see how we fight am, among each other in the way of national egoism that we abandon all the, all, all the values that cooperating together, it's much more efficient here. But I, Mr. Bruni, I love you to choose uh, uh, the Stefan, Stefan Zweig uh, example. Because another, if I should give out two books to read, uh, this, the second would be, and maybe first in the order would be his last book he wrote before he committed suicide. It was called uh, The World of Yesterday, in which he is uh, everybody who is having only, because, People back home, and often where I go to speak, they say, oh, you are such a pessimist. You are maybe a little too paranoid. But I always say, read Zweig. Uh, how by the end of the 30s, the Viennese Jews were saying, oh, you know, this is what is coming. It's so insane. This cannot happen. And even if that level of insanity we will hit little wall, we will have a little bang, but then the pendulum will swing and we would get in the normalcy. Well, in the normalcy, well, it took five years. It took hundreds of millions of life and it turned world upside down. So we should be a little paranoid today in Europe and we should not, we should not uh, accept the bar set so low because if we will continue taking this bar lower and lower and lower, and this applies to Mr. Trump, this applies to European populists, whatever is the label, if it's the left, right, uh, whoever will lean. We have to confront it, we have to confront it. If they say this is because of liberals were too politically correct, Truth is, because we are politically correct, not labeling these idiots the right way. If you are Nazi, you are Nazi, full stop, you know, and right in your face. What I hear a lot of in this panel is a, a lot of intention. We should, uh, we should cooperate more, uh, we should have more integration in a way that's typical of European language. It's about intention, we should have more multilateralism, but at the same time you have a president of the United States who is quite strongly uh, fighting multilateralism. Yeah. So, this is my last question, and then I open the floor uh, for question. So, Lee, um, how realistic are all these uh, intentions? It's nice on paper, but how do you go about making them real, especially in the current uh, environment in, in Europe? I think it's very good for the European Union and its institutions to be developing uh, plans for the future, to be putting ideas uh, on the table. Um, the Commission uh, does have a number of areas where it is extremely effective, areas of policy that it can further develop. You mentioned technology. I think uh, the knowledge triangle is a very positive area for the EU competition policy. I mean, the EU does have real tools that can be genuinely effective. But these are all within the realm of the status quo. These are instruments that we dispose of for the time being. But we're in a period when you're right. Uh, there's no distinction. You know, when I was a student, they used to tell us uh, uh, British uh, uh, positivist philosophy that we have to distinguish between an ought statement and an is statement. <laughs> and many of the things that I've been hearing are ought statements. And this is what we should do. This is what we, this is what Europeans think. This is what we think. I'd like to ask who is the we and who are the Europeans? Mm. Because the European Union consists of member states. It consists of people within those member states and political movements within those member states. And the EU institutions are to some extent an emanation of them. And I think the real challenge is to connect once more the institutions of the European Union with public opinion, 
because there is a real disconnect today and there are political leaders in the member state with a vested interest in trading on that disconnect. And I think one of the most effective ways of trying to do that is to try and find a new narrative that is meaningful, especially for young people. Because we have no narrative today. I mean, we've heard about Belt and Road, maybe that is a kind of narrative that can be criticized, but at least it's a narrative. Um, we had a session this morning on Russia. Uh, Mr. Karaganov's name was mentioned. He's one of those who has been developing the narrative of Eurasia. It's a faulted narrative, but it is a narrative. Mm. The European Union, we used to have stability, security, prosperity as our kind of motto, but with extremely high levels of uh, youth unemployment, uh, with the fact, thankfully, that most of our young people in Western Europe have only ever known peace. Uh, apart from the terrible wars of the former Yugoslavia, you have a whole generation that's only known peace. So for them, stability doesn't mean all that much. And uh, security is a little bit vague for them as well. So we have to find a way of speaking, particularly to the younger generations. And we have an opportunity next year with the renewal of the EU institutions for once to choose political leaders who do have the capacity to develop a narrative, to speak to young people, uh, to speak to those who previously may have paid no attention to the European Union. The problem is that under the guise of more de uh, democracy, this sort of lead candidate system that's developed, actually is producing potential leaders you know, who have been chosen in, shall I say, smoke-free rooms no longer smoke-filled rooms. Um, I mean, this is how the lead candidates are chosen in reality. And I'm afraid it looks very much, rather than choosing a 49 or 50-year-old um, woman, for example, to head one of the lists uh, with a real capacity to speak to younger generations, to speak to a more diverse European public, we are falling back on old habits. There's still time between now and next May. And I think if we want to bridge this gap and to connect again with public opinion and to develop a narrative that is meaningful, especially to young people, we should pay particular attention to our choice of leaders. And next year's European Parliament election and the renewal of the leadership of all our institutions is an opportunity to do just that. Right. Now I'd like to open this, uh, this session for, for questions. I have two people who are listed now. Uh, Mr. Sahar al Ajmi. Can you just yes. raise your hand? Or over there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, my name is Saad al Ajmi. I'm from Kuwait University. I wanted oh, to yeah. thank uh, Dr. Tissam and co. and uh, panelists and uh, chairman. Um, and I have a question for Sir Michael, and excuse my ignorance, but do you envisage a second Brexit vote, perhaps preceded by some sort of a national poll to ask whether it is okay to have a second you know, Brexit vote? poll uh, or vote uh, in order to ease the, the tension and to sort of like, you know, coat it with more democratic process? And if no, if the answer is no, why? I don't know of any legal impediment because, you know, this Brexit thing seems to be going in shambles. It's hitting a wall every time. You know, they have an opening here and then they hit a wall and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take uh, all the questions and then the panel will be able to respond. Mr. Uh, Nabil Fami? Can you just raise your hand? All right. Thank you. From the Arab world, from the Middle East, for generations we looked up at the European Union as the example that was wanted to emulate. Uh, it started off as an economic project that evolved over time. Uh, last decade or so, as Europe expanded, as it faced new world paradigms and so on and so forth, it seemed to be an example of what you should not do as you expand or what are the limitations of cooperation and integration rather than uh, what kind of ambitions uh, one should have. My question really is, is the European model, has it reached its limits? Because actually you don't actually have the same values or the same goals that you had with the smaller model uh, because it's a different world paradigm was it essentially an economic model that once you went beyond 
uh, the issues of economic development and went into the issues of sovereignty, you hit the limits of that kind of project. I'm, again, I'm a supporter of the EU, but I'm worried about where it's going. Thank you very much. Um, so, no, no one wants to? Okay. So, um, Sir Lee, let's start by you answering this question, and then uh, we'll go with each of the speaker, and then we'll close the, the, the panel. I couldn't agree more with the spirit of your question, and um, you addressed it to me. Unfortunately, I'm not in a position to uh, affect the outcome. If I had been, uh, the situation might have been rather different. But um, one has to take the situation as from where we are today. Um, this question that you posed was posed to number 10 Downing Street uh, two or three days ago after the brother of Boris Johnson, uh, who, was a uh, who was a member of parliament and had been a, a minister, resigned his post as minister and uh, called for uh, an, a, a, another opportunity for the people to express themselves. And uh, number 10 Downing Street replied, under no circumstances will there be a second referendum, quote, unquote, which I find quite astonishing in a democratic uh, country where anyway it will be up to parliament in the end to decide whether or not there should be a second referendum. The problem is that when the first referendum took place, the people were never asked what kind of Brexit they wanted, and they were never really acquainted with the options uh, or the possible consequences. By the way, in terms of our previous discussion, um, one of the issues that might have been a swing issue at the time was the claim that the EU was about to establish a European army, which was not true then and it's not true now. But it swayed a lot of people who were afraid that this would undermine NATO, to which uh, the UK was uh, very strongly uh, attached. So the main question now will be, if the government uh, succeeds in concluding um, an agreement with the European Union and then presents that to Parliament for approval, and if Parliament were not to approve it, what would happen then? The government, uh, until now, uh, has implied that it would not give an option in any vote uh, for a second referendum. Of course, some members of Parliament could put down uh, amendments calling for this. You never know. But it's very hard to see what the path would be from where we are today to actually adopting a law and putting into place all the necessary preparations for a referendum in the very short time between now and the 29th of March next year when the UK is scheduled to leave the EU. Apart from that, people will argue, what would it settle? Because just supposing the last referendum came out pretty much 52% uh, for leave, 48% for remain. Now supposing it were just about the other way around next time, it would be contested as well. Mm. What then? Some mm. people say, should we have a third referendum mm. and make it the best out of three? <laughs> um, it, it's a very problematic mm. subject. However, there is a head of steam building up in, the, in, in, in public opinion, which is very dissatisfied with the conduct of the negotiations. And you, can, you never really know. Uh, a, a very good friend of mine says, the, the kind of thing you should do in a discussion like this is make your best possible analysis of what might happen, and then go out to your bookmaker and immediately bet on the opposite. <laughs> right, I think for a matter of time, because we're running behind schedule, we have to, to, to draw this panel to a close. I would like to really thank you, gentlemen, for uh, this discussion. And uh, we have a, a break now. We'll resume after the break brief and your panel. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.